Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. I wrote my newsletter today about President Trump's comments. I, I think part of the thing that we always struggle against is not to be numbed by all of this, to have the former president come out and lavish Vladimir Putin with praise because, I mean, we kind of know that that's where he comes from. Still, it's an extraordinary moment. And for extraordinary moments like this, who better to turn to than our colleague, Bill Crystal? Good morning, Bill. Good morning, Charlie. Thanks. On the day that the current president is announcing the first tranche of sanctions against Russia for its aggression in Ukraine, the same day that the Europeans are announcing their sanctions, and we are trying to rally the world against the naked aggression of Vladimir Putin, Donald Trump calls into a podcast, the Clay and Buck Show, don't ask, and again, just lavishes praise on his, his old buddy, Vladimir Putin. Let's play this. I went in yesterday and there was a television screen and I said, this is genius. Putin declares a big portion of the Ukraine, of Ukraine. Putin declares it as independent. Oh, that's wonderful. So Putin is now saying it's independent, a large section of Ukraine. I said, how smart is that? And he's going to go in and be a peacekeeper. That's the strongest peace force. We could use that on our southern border. That's the strongest peace force I've ever seen. There were more army tanks than I've ever seen. They're going to keep peace all right. No, but think of it. Here's a guy who's very savvy. I know him very well, very, very well. By the way, this never would have happened with us. Had I been in office, not even thinkable. This would never have happened. But here's a guy that says, you know, uh, I'm going to declare a big portion of Ukraine independent. He used the word independent. And we're going to go out and we're going to go in and we're going to help keep peace. You got to say that's pretty savvy. And you know what the response was from Biden? There was no response. They didn't have one for that. Now it's very sad. Okay, brilliant, savvy. Bill, on one level, this is, this is really shocking. On another level, it's exactly what we've come to expect from Donald Trump, right? Yeah, I mean, Donald Trump's presidency and his post-presidency are really shocking. I guess maybe that's a, that, that puts those two points together, and, and we should retain the capacity to be shocked because this is not the way things work in a healthy democracy with a most recent president whose instinct in normal times would be to support the current president in a foreign policy crisis uh, or maybe offer some constructive suggestions not to praise and to fawning praise the dictator of Russia. I guess I heard this maybe late in the afternoon yesterday, and then but by chance, really a week ago, went to a dinner about a dozen people in D.C. with a Russian dissident who was in town. Had, I think previously planned to be in town. It wasn't connected to the Ukraine crisis. Close associate of Navalny. This fellow's been in exile for six or seven years. You talk to these dissidents, they're so impressive, so courageous, fighting in their own country in Russia for freedom and democracy. And to, to, to see that and talk about what Putin has done at home and abroad and, and the murders and the oppression and the really savage, brutal kind of dictatorship that he has managed to set up and now is inflicting uh, in a way externally on the Ukrainian and more of the Ukrainian people. Uh, and then you listen to Trump, but it, it's it's horrifying, really. It just makes me feel kind of sick to my stomach. I've got to say, this is the president of the United States. God knows we've had uh, policies that have failed and presidents who have been, haven't been perfect, to say the least. But to have basically a president who's all of whose sympathy, more than sympathy, whose adulation, who's, uh, who fawns over this foreign dictator, not a word to say. That's the other thing, right? Not a word to say of support for the brave people of Ukraine, needless to say, not a word for the democratically elected leader of Ukraine, whom Trump, of course, uh, hates and tried to pressure into doing something that he shouldn't have done, incidentally, and, and he didn't do. Um, uh, it just, it's its horrible. Thank God he's not president anymore. Yeah, but, but it is a consistent line, you know, throughout his career. I, I went back and I, I found some of the references, you know, when he praised the Chinese for the crackdown in Tiananmen Square, and he compared that favorably to uh, Gorbachev, who was not being oppressive enough, or, or back in 2013, when Vladimir Putin had an op-ed piece in the New York Times, Trump tweeted out, Putin's letter is a masterpiece for Russia and a disaster for us, and went on to say how brilliant of Vladimir Putin was and how bad it made Obama look. And, and then he also, interestingly enough, I'd forgotten about this, that Trump fully embraced Putin's criticism of the idea of American exceptionalism. 
and basically said, talk about American exceptionalism was insulting. Of course, this was before he became president. 2014, after Putin had seized Crimea, basically Trump embraced all of his talking points that the Crimeans actually wanted. And of course, you remember, you and I both remember 2017, when he's being asked by Bill O'Reilly why he likes Putin so much. And O'Reilly, who's pretty deplorable himself, says, but he's a killer. And Trump says, there are a lot of killers. You think our country is so innocent? So, I mean, there's, a, I mean, then of course there's, you know, Helsinki, et cetera. I mean, it goes on and on and on. So this is completely consistent. There's, there's nothing really genuinely shocking about it, but it is interesting watching what's happening with the Republican party, um, that there is no rallying around, you know, it's a, if, if they're not overtly pro Putin, um, at least they've settled into a, you know, pretty solid anti-Bidenism. Yeah, no, I think that's, we should talk about that. But uh, there's sort of mixed signals a little bit coming from the Republican Party. But just on one four point on Trump, which I think you've, you hinted at, but just to draw that out, what's striking is this, uh, just as, as I think about it here, you know, we've all talked and read about the rise of authoritarianism in the U.S., what conditions lead to it, what elements it has, and comparisons with foreign countries, and it's all very interesting and important. I, I, what sometimes always forgets the most elementary fact, which is Trump is actually pro-authoritarian. He's not, you know, a, a democratic figure who happens, unfortunately, to have authoritarian tendencies. You might say that would be pretty common among demagogues. Maybe there's a little bit of it among almost every politician, right? They like to hear themselves talk and they like people following them and being applauded and so forth. But we're not talking about sort of inadvertent authoritarianism or a system that is unfortunately tilted towards authoritarianism. I mean, we're talking about some of that too, but we're talking about a a leader of one of our two parties who was president of the United States, who is actually prefers authoritarianism. I think we can say that. And, I think you and, can and, say and, that. And favors, yeah. you know, and, and, and praises authoritarian leaders abroad and has no particular sympathy for democratic leaders or democratic movements or people fighting for their freedom. That's really astonishing. And it does, it makes it all the more astonishing that this man was not relegated to the margins of American politics. And even after everything and after January 6th has not been relegated to the margins of the Republican Party. No, I, mean, I think this is literally true. I mean, and on one level, you could say that he just likes people who, who you know, praise him and suck up to him. But but it is deeper than that. I mean, the, the fact that he went out of his way to endorse Viktor Orban for reelection in, in Hungary. Why Orban of all the world leaders? What is his fascination with Kim in North Korea? You know, and, and his love affair with Vladimir Putin has lasted now for decades. So, you know, you're right. You know, in a lot of ways, we've talked about Trump almost endlessly. And, and that's the part that I think, you know, has not been fully, I think, fully vetted, you know, by people on the right, that you understand that this guy is not just sort of an unhinged narcissist. There is this real, you know, fascination with power and force and brutality. And he really, really admires Vladimir Putin. I mean, he, he looks at Vladimir Putin and says, that's the way it ought to be. That's where we're at. Yeah. It almost trumps the narcissism, right? I mean, because narcissists mm -hmm. presumably admire themselves more than anyone else. Yeah. But in this case, he seems to have a man crush yeah. on Putin that maybe uh, and sort of is willing to almost support himself, you might say, to Putin. Yeah. Look, look, that clip you played, uh, which is very, very revealing, of course. And uh, yeah, no, it's it's just terrible. And, and the fact that now it's an interesting question. What do you think about the Republican Party? It feels to me like on the one hand, of course, no one's taking Trump. Not many people are taking Trump on except for the the one person who has courage, Liz Cheney, but yeah. everyone else has sort of been quiet. In terms of their actual policies, a fair number of Republicans are, you know, uh, reasonably tough and condemning Putin and and want to even do a little more than Biden's done so far in sanctions to uh, against Putin and, and say they want to support Ukraine and are pro-NATO. Is it a moment where uh, going from being a pro-Trump party to a pro-Putin party is a bridge too far for some of these uh, Trump acquiescent Republicans, or do they just kind of, kind of put that under the carpet and 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 just go on with business as usual? Well, that's an interesting question. I'm actually writing a piece on this, sort of a guide to the perplexed, because there's a lot of cognitive dissonance. Right, you you have some Republicans who are praising Putin, who are saying that Putin is not doing anything wrong, and then of course you have other Republicans who are saying that Biden needs to be even tougher. One thing they unite on is, is that, that Biden's either a weenie or a warmonger, but at least there's a through line. But 
and look, I, who knows how this is going to play out, but okay, let me take my cynical approach because we've seen kind of how this plays out in the past. There's a gap right now between the entertainment wing of the Republican Party and its elected wing, right? The elected yes. rump. So the elected officials are still taking a pretty strong line on Russia. The entertainment wing and the MAGAverse is increasingly becoming, if not overtly pro-Putin, then at least anti-anti-Putin. So the important thing to keep in mind, though, I think, is that the entertainment wing has been and is going to continue to be dominant in the Republican Party. They are the leading indicator. This is the party's id. And if the past is any indication, the rest is eventually going to come along, right? I mean, so the fact that you have, you know, Tucker Carlson out there pushing an anti-anti-Putin line or a pro-Putin line, uh, the, the fact that you have people like uh, Candace Owens or Charlie Kirk, who under normal circumstances would be fringe characters or J.D. Vance saying he doesn't care about Ukraine. These are all people who are very much adjacent to MAGA world. And I have to say that here's an indicator. And I, again, I do we read too much into this? Candace Owens, who works for Ben Shapiro and has millions of followers, OK? And I'm not saying that she speaks for the Republican Party right now, but she tweeted this out. I suggest every American who wants to know what's actually going on in Russia and Ukraine read this transcript of Putin's address, this unhinged, rambling series of lies about you know, Ukrainian history. Anyway, as I've said for a month, NATO, under direction from the United States, is violating previous agreements and expanding eastward. We, in capital letters, are at fault. Now, this tweet was liked by Donald Trump Jr., so you kind of know where you're going on all of this. So we know where the MAGA world is going. So I don't know. There's this cognitive dissonance right now. But if I had to say which way the wind is blowing, I would say that the it of the party right now is uh, is anti-anti-Putin. Can I play Tucker Carlson for a moment? Because I want to talk about uh, your tweet yesterday. Yeah, sure. Okay. So as an indication of what I'm talking about here, here is one of the leading voices, not just anti-Biden, but seeming like, why, why should we be mad at Putin? Here's Tucker Carlson last night. What is this really about? Why do I hate Putin so much? Has Putin ever called me a racist? Has he threatened to get me fired for disagreeing with him? Has he shipped every middle class job in my town to Russia? Did he manufacture a worldwide pandemic that wrecked my business and kept me indoors for two years? Is he teaching my children to embrace racial discrimination? Is he making fentanyl? Is he trying to snuff out Christianity? Does he eat dogs? These are fair questions. And the answer to all of them is no. Vladimir Putin didn't do any of that. So, Bill, your thoughts. Vladimir Putin has never said anything mean about me. He's never mean tweeted me. I mean, so on, the, on your first point, which I think is a very interesting one, and it's just to take a minute on it, though, was it is important, actually, in terms of the American politics. Um, yeah, the MAGAverse has certainly prevailed over the, let's call it, what remains of establishment Republicanism and, you know, bush McCain Republicanism uh, over the last, what, six, seven years. Every time there's been a, a dissonance, a cognitive dissonance, whatever you want to call it, a clash, at the end of the day, the MAGAverse is basically, the, the establishment has collapsed, uh, the huge bulk of it. And so maybe that will happen this time. Maybe, you know, on a foreign policy crisis, maybe Putin is a bridge too far for a few more people. Maybe it there's a little bit of a splintering. For now, it could be papered over, you know, Biden's behaving horribly and you sort of make a claim we have to be much tougher, but very vague. But, you know, this crisis will go on and there'll be actual decisions that will have to be made. There'll be actual legislation, mm -hmm. right. defense budget, further sanctions that will actually, you know, we'll have to pay some price too. And at that point, where does the party go? And I, I think your prediction, unfortunately, is probably right that you certainly bet on Candace Owens over, I don't know, Mitch McConnell at this point. Tom Cotton. Yeah. 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 Right. Or, or even Cotton. Mm -hmm. I mean, Cotton right now. And those people are sort of the, the criticism of Biden is, is sort of over the top and hysterical and unseemly in the middle of a crisis. You know, the sanctions should be one day earlier or, or considerably tougher. Maybe they should be. It's hard to judge that from the outside, but mm -hmm. you can make those criticisms in a respectful way of the American president, not demeaning him. But anyway, but at least they're directionally in the right direction. Um, anyway, I, I am curious to see how that goes and, and where the party ends up. And there'll be a bunch of set of primaries where they're actually candidates sounding more like, if you want Tom Cotton and others sounding more like Candace Owens. So CPAC this weekend, incidentally, it'll be interesting to see and someone yes. probably should, some poor person, maybe we'll make one of the young people at the Office of Defending Democracy together do this, listen to all the panels, 
uh, what a ghastly thought. And um, you know, write down how many are sort of flat out pro Putin, how many are actually anti Putin, and how many just duck and, and don't don't address it and just are anti Biden. You know, it'd be an interesting kind of snapshot of a certain part of the conservative movement and the Republican Party for now. I think that will be, and yeah, yeah, I think that's an excellent idea. And the fact that the, the Tulsi Gabbard is a featured speaker at CPAC, I think, speaks volumes. And I think there's something at Mar-a-Lago today, isn't there? So today's Wednesday, we're speaking in the morning. A bunch of candidates are coming there to court Trump support or whatever. So, but yeah, so the opponent to Liz Cheney is is going to be there, so I gather, uh, you know, being quote right. interviewed by Jim Jordan. That's kind of amusing. Yeah, what will their position be? Trump will be there, I guess, or at least it'll be at Mar-a-Lago. Will they just avoid the whole topic, the leading topic in American politics and world politics today? Will um, Cheney's opponent say something critical of Putin? Will Cheney's opponent sound like Trump? I, it'd just be an interesting thing to watch, you know? It will be. And you, know, you and I are going to be at this uh, Principal's First Conference in D.C. this weekend. And we we'll talk about a contrast because at that conference, the keynote speakers are Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger. Mm -hmm. They're going to be featuring Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman. They'll have a ceremony with Capitol Hill police officer Harry Dunn. Very different, uh, very different lineup. I think it it will be worthwhile putting them side by side. No, I think that conference ends on Sunday with the panel. Mm -hmm. I think maybe I'm moderating it. Yeah. You and Mona Charon, you've been fighting in these trenches a long time. Mona wrote a whole book called Useful Idiots about the <laughs> left <laughs> excusing of the Soviet Union back in the day. And she and I were just texting the other day about how she should do an updated version on the right and Putin, you know. And then Kathy Young, who I genuinely knows a ton about, of course, Russia and Ukraine and, and all these issues. So I hope we'll focus maybe on foreign policy precisely to make the point. This is now a huge issue in the world and in American politics. And just as Soviet Union was and or what to do about how to fight the Cold War was in 1948 or 49 or, or subsequently 1979, 1980, it'd be silly to, to duck it. And so maybe we can discuss that there. So anyway, it'd be interesting to see what happens at Mar-a-Lago today. It's interesting to see what happens at CPAC this weekend. And uh, look, I hope for the sake of the country, there are more Lindsey Grahams and Tom Cottons on this and fewer Candace Owens, and we'll see. Uh, but as you say, this, the last five, six years would suggest not to be too confident of that. If the fate of the Republic rests on the character of Lindsey Graham, we are royally screwed. I know, but you know, that's what... Uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I know. We are. We, maybe, maybe we are. Now, so, Tucker Carlson, the turning of a serious issue into a matter of personal grievance, I mean, obviously, it's a rhetorical thing, and it's TV, and I don't want to overinterpret you know, one little tirade of his. But I think it's very revealing, don't you? Uh, I think you and I both speak about this, that, I mean, it's so unseemly, the idea that you would make up your mind about a war in which tens of thousands of people could be killed, in which the freedom of a country, the sovereignty of a country is at stake, the whole order in Europe and so forth, because you personally perhaps haven't been affected by this dictator, you know, thousands of miles away. It's almost farcical, right? If you're at all an educated or serious person, even if you're an uneducated and semi-serious person, in fact, the uneducated maybe in some ways have more of an instinct of that this, you can't just abandon moral judgments because you personally haven't been personally. That's literally what he's saying. Think about well, it for a minute. I, I could say the same thing about Paul Pot. I mean, Paul Pot right. has never said anything bad about me, has never done any of these terrible things to me. Right. Uh, by the way, so Will Salatin has a great piece that just went up in the bulwark while you and I were speaking called Father Carlson. Tucker Carlson is on Russia's side. And, and the Father Carlson is a reference to the role of Charles Coughlin, Father right. Coughlin, back in the 1930s who was one of the leaders of the, the isolationist appeasement movement. You tweeted out yesterday that Tucker Carlson was getting into Lord Haw Haw territory. <laughs> and, and, and for people who forget who Lord Haw Haw was, Bill. He was English speaking. Was he American or British? Well, I can't he, remember that. He was that. American born. His name was actually, he wasn't really named Lord Haw Haw. He actually was American born. His name was William Joyce. But he went to and Berlin he, during, he was a fascist and went to yeah. Berlin during, in 1940, I think, and broadcast from there yep. during the war to England, encouraging trees and, I mean, literally in yeah, this case, literally. you know, and subverting, trying to subvert the British war effort. They, they dubbed him Lord Haw Haw contemptuously. And I think he was hanged or executed at the end of he the war. He was in 1946. No, it's interesting. And you know, remember, there's a long history of these broadcasts. I, I don't know whether Tucker Carlson is, uh, has really gone that far, but... No, you know, it's a bit of an exaggeration, but I mean, it's the most popular show on the most popular cable news political, I guess, network, right? 
everyone can say, oh, it's only three and a half million viewers. That's a huge country, 300 million. Yeah, fine. But still, it's got a lot of it's viewers. very influential. And quite influential in, a, in one of the two major parties. And, and he is approaching that territory. But again, the personal grievance side of it, I think, is revealing about the character of, of Trumpism, that it's the unembarrassed way in which it becomes all about you. And I haven't been insulted by this person, so I don't have to worry about the fact that he's killing thousands, tens of thousands of people and trying to subjugate a sovereign country, uh, and because I, I at least uh, can plausibly say that it hasn't affected me or hasn't affected me yet. And look at the grievances, incidentally. They're juvenile, right? I mean, they're either- They're very, yeah. They're about, he hasn't literally insulted me as one of them, I believe, hasn't attacked me. And then others are just, you know, silly. I mean, he hasn't destroyed Christianity or whatever Carlson says, you know, as, as if who's done that in America? You know, type this Joe Biden on a crusade against Christianity. I think the guy goes to church probably more than Tucker Carlson. So it's revealing somehow the kind of degree to which the personal resentments, anxieties have been elevated. And Trumpism legitimates that, right? Trumpism is about you take something that makes you unhappy, that you don't like too much about America today. And God knows there are plenty of things all of us don't like about this massive country we live in, and there are things that we would prefer were done somewhat differently, and people had different attitudes and different ways of living and so forth. No one loves everything about any country at any one time, right? But instead of working to change those things or accepting that there are some things you can't change in a massive free society, and there are just things you'll have to prefer and other things you'll have to not like very much, you resent it, you dislike it, you make it into some conspiracy against you. And then that's what your politics are. And that's so much what Trumpism is about. And I do think that fits very much into authoritarianism, to get back yeah. to our earlier discussion. And the authoritarian takes advantage of that and fosters it and shapes it into support for him and for authoritarian policies. So I think with Carlson's support of both Putin and the way in which he framed things last night, it's it's a little bit of a revealing snapshot, a revealing moment insight into the, the soul of Trumpist authoritarianism. I want to talk about the way Joe Biden is handling this and what do you think is going to happen. But let's just stay with Vladimir Putin for a moment. What is your read on Vladimir Putin? Carl Bildt, uh, the former prime minister of Sweden, tweeted out yesterday, this is a man with immense power who's lost contact with reality. Is Vladimir Putin right now a completely rational actor? Well, it sort of depends what he means about rational. This is no. much debated. You know, I, no. I would say so far he's gotten away with most of what he's, yes. that he's tried to do, and it's not clear that he won't get away with this. And he's in power. He's been there 20 years. He's in power. Russia's had setbacks from him being in power, but on the other hand, he's gotten away with a lot, and now he's trying to rectify some of the setbacks, the main one being Ukraine moving to the West, partly out of horror, looking at what's happening to their North and East in, in, in Russia. But he's trying to rectify that. And if he gets away with this, uh, we can say it's irrational. Maybe ultimately, in some judgment of history, it's irrational. But short, medium term, uh, he's he's pretty calculating. So no, I, I think it's a mistake to underestimate Putin. It's a mistake to look at his tirade and say, oh my God, he's gone off the rails. What, he, it's madness. It's all self-defeating. I've always, for two or three months, I've been critical of the kind of, oh, it would be just a terrible mistake from his point of view, a disaster from his mm -hmm. point of view to go to war. I mean, let's hope it's a disaster, but we have to help make it a disaster. And, you know, unfortunately, conquests sometimes work, and at least they work for a while. And the way in which he's doing it is pretty calculated. It's, you know, so far, I think the West's response has been pretty good, so he's not quite getting away as he might have hoped to with the kind of salami-style uh, tactics. But uh, let's see, right? I mean, he's assuming we can't hold the line, that, that the sanctions will fade, that he'll get away with, and I think there'll be much, much more violence. So it's, we're, we're only a tiny bit into the story at this point. No, but I think it's, look, it's always safer to, not to underestimate your opponents, your enemies, right? And there's no right. reason for us to be sitting around saying, oh my God, did you see that? What a wacko. That's really foolish. That's, that's you know, like looking at a, some mass murderer in your neighborhood and saying, well, the guy's a little crazy, which he is. And therefore we don't have to take precautions. We don't have to lock our houses and we don't have to find that person and lock them up. I mean, that's what we have to do here. So what is your reaction to the first tranche of sanctions? There are a lot of Republicans who have been very, very critical of, of Joe Biden for not going stronger. You know, there was a debate. Should they have done preemptive sanctions? Um, should they have had stronger sanctions? Should they go after Putin himself? What What is your take in terms of the, the sort of the calibrated response that we're seeing right now? 
I mean, I say my my sort of high level take on these things, having been in government when, when Saddam invaded Kuwait, maybe I'm shaped a little by that. We sort of messed up various things. Uh, we were uncertain at first. We we were a little opaque in our arguments at times. We we weren't bringing the American public along. People were very worried about that in the late 1990. Mm-hmm. Did probably miscalculate a few things. Is <laughs> these things are never perfect, right? I think they're going in the right direction, and I think. There's a legitimate debate, which I'm not sure where I would come down, because I also feel like I just don't know enough about, yeah. you don't want to do everything right at first, partly because you need to bring along allies, you need to bring along the business community, the American public, and so forth. And you do need to make clear it's Putin's responsibility if you get the really bad sanctions by really doing even worse things that he's done so far. So I don't think that's an unreasonable position of the Biden administration, as long as they are willing to do the serious things later. The Republicans for about 24 hours were a little hysterical. I think some of them, went, he should be doing everything right now. Well, why? I mean, it's the Republicans don't think it's going to deter Putin. I don't think that was really, you know, that if he did everything right now, Putin wouldn't accel- uh, uh, accelerate the war, or intensify the war, uh, expand the war against Ukraine. So it makes us feel better to do it all at once. But honestly, it's not as if any, it matters if it, if you don't do it well, for a week or two. I don't think so. On the other hand, I think the counter argument is it looks a little weak not to do everything at once. Maybe it encourages Putin to think he can get away with it. So I, I think those are tough prudential calls. I would be inclined to be a little harder line, I guess, than the Biden administration. But I also think that, you know, this will, the, the events will end up driving this and will, it, and it, I've got to say, I'm, encouraged by the fact that they seem to be talking ultimately about very serious sanctions, including SWIFT, which would really be a big deal. That's the and big one, yeah. The crackdown on the on access to the international banking system. Yeah. And and B, that they seem to have the Euro- Europeans on board more than one might have thought. So I, I guess I'm on the whole somewhat encouraged. Yeah. So on the question of when do you impose the sanctions, I mean, clearly, uh, you know, Putin himself is doing this a little bit incrementally. He goes into these, quote unquote, breakaway republics, and he's probably looking around saying, "Okay, are they bluffing? What are they going to do? There is that maybe 48 hour, 72 hour period where he has to make the decision. Do you just take off that slice of salami or do you go in and invade Ukraine altogether? Now, in terms of the response, I, I, I thought the most significant, obviously, was uh, Nord Stream 2, because it was not clear at all the Germans would go along with that. I mean, that was, in some ways, a pleasant surprise, and that had to get his attention that that the West is not completely bluffing when it comes to all of this. Now, whether it dissuades him from going into Kiev, uh, we, we, we just don't know. But And by the way, just your mention of SWIFT, I talked about this with Tim O'Brien from Bloomberg yesterday. That basically would cut off the Russians from the international banking system. They wouldn't be able to like get money. I mean, it would just it would just shut everything down. It would have a devastating effect on their economy. Uh, so that's that's one of the sort of the nuclear shots against the economy. So give me your thoughts on that. The Nord Stream two, I thought was was a very significant moment. Yeah, I, I think so. So I think all in all, it's a bit of a halting reaction, a little slow at times, a little unclear, you know, like any, but again, this always happens in crisis. Some senior official on background briefs in a way that turns out to be bad and then misleadingly soft, let's say. That happened, I think, when it was that Monday night and it had to be corrected Tuesday morning on the record by senior officials and by Biden himself. So, and you can pick at that and say, well, they should have their act together a little better. But on the whole, they have their act together better than I might've expected, I've got to say, and they've got the allies on board. And I think they have a path towards very, very serious sanctions. I think what people haven't thought through, and this isn't really a criticism of the administration, this is just a fact about life, I think, is that this is such a big event. I mean, and when you get into a real inflection point like this will be, assuming he goes further, and he's going to go further, I'm almost certain, things happen that people don't expect uh, internationally, domestically, things change. They can change for the worse, obviously, in much in very bad ways. They can also change for the better in terms of people's reactions. What we were talking about, about the Republican Party is just one element of that. Germany, another, I mean, all kinds of things. We're going to be surprised by a lot of things over the next few months, I guess is what I would say. And we can shape some of those surprises. And this is where I think really understanding that we can't just, this isn't just patching up the 
architecture of the last 30 years and say, gee, Putin's gone a little further than some other people have. We probably have to do a little more to, in response. And so, you know, it's sort of like there's a little more uh, termite erosion in the house. So we need to get in a tougher, better bug, you know, bug spraying company or something. I think we're looking at a pretty fundamental change. If he's got Belarus sort of now as a puppet mm -hmm. state, if he either can uh, take a chunk of Ukraine or destabilize the government there and end up with a kind of puppet or friendly regime there. And I do think that's fundamental for me. All the NATO stuff is nonsense. He needs, at this point, he he can't afford to let a pro-Western government, uh, can't afford to leave a pro-Western government in charge of Ukraine, even of most of Ukraine at this point, I'd say. So he needs to destabilize the regime. Now he can do that incrementally and slowly by sort of strangling it economically and, and putting more and more pressure on it, salami style. He can do it with one massive sweep, or he can try to, or two or three massive strokes. You know, these things are never quite as clean. Uh, you know, it's like, well, he's, is he going all in, or is he just going to stop? Well, the, you know, there are a million in-between scenarios, but he can't afford to leave it there. But if he were to succeed with Ukraine and Belarus being, in effect, Warsaw Pact types puppet states, maybe then even more so, more like the Soviet Union petitioning for admission to the Russian Federation, one could mm -hmm. imagine that scenario too. With sure. Russia. I mean, that is a huge change in the security structure of Europe. Our friend Bob Kagan wrote about that the other day, and and we've had good pieces in the Bulwark discussing this too. You've written well on this in JVL. I, I think it's people are kind of underestimating how big a, a deal it is. But again, there's the, the people do have, again, the sense a little bit of, oh, is he just stopping or is he going? You know, as if it's a green light, a yellow light, a red light, as opposed to many, many shades of yellow, but all tending towards green, if I can put it that way. He wants to accomplish big things. Hitler, Munich, that's the Munich is the symbol of appeasement, as it should be. Uh, Hitler got part of Czechoslovakia after, in the Munich deal on September 30th, I think it was, uh, 1938. He didn't actually take the rest of Czechoslovakia until, I think it was March 1939, mm -hmm. you know, Hitler finishes the conquest of Czechoslovakia. So it's not as if other dictators, including extremely aggressive ones, haven't understood that sometimes you you swallow one piece before going to the next. I, I do stick with this military buildup, though. I I remain, I'm in a bit of a minority, I'd say, among my friends here in Washington who follow this stuff closely, but I, I remain convinced it's bigger, Putin's going to go bigger faster than people kind of realize, and then the crisis will be upon us. He may think that that shock would jolt us back from being tough. I, I don't know that he gains a lot by from the kind of uh, very slow motion strategy, but look, so you, it'll be so some you're, combination you're, of the two, and, okay. I, and I don't know, and I don't, and, and things will change depending on how he judges uh, a million things, including the, the actual military preparedness on both sides and, and so forth. Yeah, are you anticipating something like a shock and awe campaign that would bring Kiev down in, in 24, 48 hours, something like that? I, I guess if I had to guess, I think he'll go beyond the line of demarcation in those two provinces, and that will Ukraine will have to respond, and then there'll be fake provocation, which he can then respond to. And then he'll say, well, look, I can't just fight in these two fronts. I've got to disable their other things. So that's when you get the bombing of Kiev and so forth. Now, I don't know that that succeeds in bringing the government down. I don't know how much damage. I just, you'd have to be much more of a military expert than I. And as we know from many wars, these things are a little unpredictable anyway, how effective Ukraine can be at fighting back. I was on a call the other day with a retired general who startled me by saying, just in passing, and he was very intelligent and sensible about what this sort of situation was. He said, you know, we there could be a Berlin airlift type situation where we could help Kiev. And mm. I, I sort of said to him, well, are you suggesting American? I'm not against it, but would you, are you suggesting we would actually like fly things into Kiev or for that matter into the west of Ukraine or truck them across the border? That's pretty provocative. I'm not against it necessarily. Just we People haven't talked about that much, you know. And he said, well, he wasn't sure, but, you know, these things can get to a situation. Are we just going to sit and watch and not try to do anything if he really does just unleash death and destruction from the air on innocent civilians in Western Ukraine? Maybe. Or are we just going to tighten sanctions? Are we going to ship in a few things by truck? Or is there conceivably a greater involvement? That's where, I mean, these wars, things are so unpredictable once the actual conflict begins. I've been reading a lot about the Russian-Finnish war hmm. from 1939, where, where the Finns turned out to be much tougher opponents for the Russians. And, and Ukraine has been, you know, uh, described as a porcupine country right now, mm -hmm. that, you know, when you grab it, be prepared to uh, be poked a lot. It seems that it would be easy for the Russians to seize Kiev, to roll the tanks down, to, you know, disable the government. It seems much, much more difficult for them to occupy it. So it's one of those things, you broke it, you bought it. 
And Ukraine is the largest European only country, physically sized. So they could decapitate the government, but it's certainly also possible that a long term occupation would be extremely problematic, as we discovered in Iraq as the Russians discovered in Afghanistan, because Ukraine is a big country. And every report that I'm hearing is the Ukrainians are not going to be greeting the Russians as liberators. Even in some of the Russian speaking areas, there is not a lot of enthusiasm. In fact, it is kind of remarkable, the man on the street interviews showing, you know, the Ukrainians who have to understand what they're up against with the Russians saying, no, I'm prepared to take a gun. I'm prepared to go in the streets and fight. Now, whether they'll do it, we don't know. But that seems like... Ukraine might be easy to beat, but very difficult to swallow and uh, digest. Let me put it that way. No, I, I think that could well be right. And on the other hand, when you know, it's it's a massive professional army with total air superiority, yeah. presumably, and that can it's hard for individuals with guns at that point to yeah. do much against it. Maybe a little bit of sniping and damage at night and so forth. But it, it could look more like Hungary in '56 or something. It's yeah. very hard to. To say, but I, I, it's a big country, and they have professionalized their military over the last seven or eight years. Putin has, in a sense, done the Ukrainian government the favor of making clear what his intentions are, and they may have some sleeper cells and ability to do some damage in Ukraine, uh, you know, internally, and make it harder for an organized resistance to mount, or, or the government could move to the west to Lviv and then organize from there. So I, I think there are many scenarios. That's that's where I think people are just. One has to accept the limits of one's imagination in that. And and, right. and and that's where there'll be many choices for us to make. This is where I think people haven't quite come to. It's sort of like, well, here is sanctions one through six. And we're probably going to do right now we're at one or two, and then we're going to do three and four. And here are a couple of things about sending some troops to Poland and so forth. But you know, there will be moments when they're, I don't know, making this up, obviously, but Zelensky's in the, West, in the West somewhere, and the Russians having maybe destroyed a lot of Kiev but not taken it, then turn west even further. Do we just accept that, or do we really then, at that point, say, "Wait a second, uh, you know, we're going to try to establish a no-fly zone to protect at least Western Ukraine"? I mean, I don't know, but I, I just think there are many more decisions and choices we'll be faced with decisions that will affect our own defense budget, deployment of forces, and so forth. And and this is where I think this is a huge moment. And I mean, it's a sad moment, obviously, and a terrible moment, and and uh, but one where we could rise to the occasion. Or not, or some of us will, and some of us won't, and uh, and this is where again it comes back to the the degree to which I, I feel like the Democrats are pretty good so far, but again they haven't really been tested. It's one thing to say a few more sanctions, it's another thing to say well, you know fifty billion dollars worth of defense spending and actually risking American you know soldiers and pilots and so forth at least somewhat well, risking or and then there'll be cyber i mean the russians will then say we're not just sitting and taking this oh, wait whoops their city bank is down for the day and suddenly you know the whole thing the degree to which things can escalate in all kinds of ways which is an argument for, for caution and prudence obviously in some ways but mostly is an argument for really being prepared and i hope the administration i really i say this honestly and not in a kind of any kind of snarky way uh, I think they've they've shown a they've been prepared more than one might have expected, uh, especially after the Afghanistan fiasco. But they need to be prepared across the board in cyber and in covert activities and in all kinds of ways for what could happen here over the next few weeks and months. Well, I agree with that. Um, but let me tell you what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about the question of presidential leadership and whether or not uh, President Biden has done enough to explain the stakes to the American people and rally support uh, in, a, in a direct way. I think at some point he's going to have to address the nation. Um, I think that, he, that at some point he, he's going to need uh, to be more forceful about this. I'm looking at this new Politico morning console poll, mm -hmm. some mixed numbers. Uh, those surveyed mainly split over Biden's handling of the crisis, 40 percent, either strongly or somewhat approving. Forty five percent said they disapprove. 50% told pollsters that Biden would be very or somewhat responsible for Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which is stunning. 34% said that he was not to or not responsible, which would suggest to me that some of this Trumpist propaganda has broken through and that he's going to have to counter that. Now, obviously, Putin gets most of the, the blame. 64% uh, said he was very culpable, 14% saying only somewhat. But at some point, you know, presidential leadership also means rallying the nation explaining and using the bully pulpit. Your thoughts? No, very much agree with all that and, and very much agree with the uncertainty. 
about President Biden and the whole administration. I mean, it's not as if these are people who've had to deal with this before. Or, I mean, uh, let's think about Truman, which maybe is a pretty good analogy. We, we think of him with respect, I think, and admiration for much that he did and made some mistakes and left office unpopular, but still really organizing the post-Cold War, the Cold War architecture, the post-World War II architecture after taking over so suddenly and, and from Roosevelt and uh, World War II wasn't even ended. I think in, at the time, people had real doubts. I mean, one forgets. Very just, much you know, so. He was a sort of obscure Missouri senator. He made his name with some investigations of corruption, kind of, or mismanagement. Took over. He hadn't been briefed on the atomic bomb. Isn't that right? On the Manhattan yeah. Project, I think. And and they made a ton of missteps as they went through it, incidentally. And, it, you know, in the end, I think he and his team rose to the occasion. His team included George C. Marshall and Dean Acheson and, you know, people who had been through uh, World War II. And, and so that's a somewhat different situation than today. So I, I very much agree that that's one of the big variables. And and again, this really matters. These are the students of international relations look at these nations and they look at the economies and the force structures and they move the pieces around on a chessboard, but the actual leadership matters a ton. And does Putin miscalculate? Does Biden correctly calculate? Uh, do we do some things well that, that really can disrupt Russia's internal uh, ability to make this war successful for them? Do they do that the opposite to us or to Ukraine or to West or to Europe? I mean, these are all huge uh, things we don't know right now. Bill Crystal, thank you so much for coming back on the podcast. I appreciate it very much. I'm looking forward to seeing you this weekend. I'm very much looking forward to seeing you this weekend, Charlie. And by the way, um, my TV recommendation for the day, I, I have actually two. Um, but number one, Inventing Anna on Netflix is really, really good. I know we're, we're generally on the British police stuff, but this is an American show and it's pretty good. Good. I, I feel like we should, we should watch an American show occasionally. I watched the Reacher series, so that was my that was my. Oh, did, did you like to, that? My hat tip to Americana. Well, I like I've read all the thrillers, all the novels. Yeah, I'd say on the whole, I mean, there were a couple of things that I would have done. You yeah. Know, what could, Sunny what Bunch has a great review in the Bulwark of. You know, Reacher. I just saw that. Right. I haven't read it yet. I need to review. Excellent. That. Yeah, now that no, I've I, watched it, I can I can read it. Right. You can't read these things. They're all spoilers. If you if you have you watched it yet or no? No, I have not. But I read enough of Sunny's piece to think. Okay, I need to put that on my list while I'm waiting for Ozark season two to come, you know, the second part of the season two be dropped. Also, I have to say, uh, if people haven't seen it on Masterpiece Theater, the new All Creatures Great and Small is really outstanding and bears no resemblance at all really to the old original series, uh, which I actually never got into. Um, but the new one is outstanding and it's it's complete now. So at least the, the, the season is complete, but I think it's worth people's time. Okay. I, I, I think I'm writing good. this down and communicating it to my wife, of course, who's followed many of your recommendations and, uh, and your wife's and, uh, with to, to good effect. So good. We can discuss all this in person this weekend. I'm looking forward to seeing you at the principal's first conference and, and very happy to be at that. Whatever the relative numbers who support each side on this and whatever happens on it, it'd be nice to be with a lot of people. We, who are, I think doing the right thing and not be at CPAC, right? <laughs> it's hard to believe that. When, was, when were you last at CPAC? I mean, that's oh, something that people there. like us used to speak at, right? <laughs> I was there, I, I want to say 2016. That, that I was recently, actually, wow. I yeah. was there the year that Trump refused to come. That's back when when Matt Schlapp, but before he became, you know, completely Matt Schlapp, and uh, <laughs> right. told Trump no, and then Trump didn't come. And you know what I remember from that? It was, it was a very anti-Trump crowd. I mean, it was... Yeah. There's no question about it. I mean, I think Marco Rubio spoke there, and I would think that that was like 80% anti-Trump back in 2016, and look what it's become. You know, Uber MAGA understates it. Yeah, not a good six years for American conservatism. In fact, a fatal six years, perhaps, for American conservatism. Certainly for the ideas and the, and, the, and the principles. Thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back tomorrow, and we'll do this all over again.